So welcome everyone to the first of four sessions for the Language of Coaching Book Club. My name is Nick Winkleman and I am the author of The Language of Coaching. And so it is absolutely my pleasure and honor to welcome all of you here with me tonight in Ireland or wherever you are in the world. Uh, I, I want to make sure though, as I begin, that I recognize, you know, coming from the United States and recognizing the importance of what is going on in the United States and beyond, that even though tonight we are in the spirit of positivity, in the spirit of development and getting better so that we can help other people improve, that is in no way meant to sit in contrast or even disrespect of what is going on both with the COVID scenario and what we know from the protests in George Floyd. So my wife and my family has done everything we can on both of those fronts, and hopefully you are as well. And if you are directly or indirectly affected by either the protests, COVID, and everything underpinning both, my, my, my regards and my thoughts and my family's thoughts to you and yours. So, so be safe and let's continue to work as a nation as a world to do what's right, what is positive, to make sure that we can bring justice and equality to everyone worldwide. So I wanted to start there because it's an important note uh, for where we are, where we find ourselves at this point in time. So shifting now back to the topic at hand, I want to begin by giving you the overarching objective of what we're trying to achieve here. So as you can see on my screen, we have four definitive sessions. Now, if you cannot make all of these sessions, for whatever reason, I am recording them, and they will all go on my YouTube channel after this. So you will be able to revisit them, either to review or if you miss one. Obviously, being able to be here live allows you to ask the questions that you have about the book and your specific interpretation and application of it. You know, for me, I've been absolutely humbled by the various sectors that have come forward with interest in the language of coaching, from surgical specialists wanting to understand how they might be able to teach surgery skills better, to basketball and baseball and, and everything in between from a sport perspective, and obviously from a strength conditioning and a therapy. So, you know, the world is excited about how they can get better at improving and coaching movement. So the way that this will then flesh out is we'll start tonight with chapter one and a bit of background and some readings around the background of the book. Then in two weeks time, we will shift to chapters two and three, focusing on attention and memory. Two weeks after that, we will shift to chapters four and five, where we focus on focus and cueing. And then finally, chapters six and seven for our final session, which will be focusing on analogies and the roadmap from a behavior development or behavior upgrading perspective when it comes to this information. We will touch on that final session as well on the examples, if you would, that are outlined in chapters eight, nine, and 10, respectively, strong cueing, powerful cueing, and fast cueing. So don't worry if you want me to go through some of those practical examples, we will get there. My goal with this is even though we are remote, to make this as organic as possible. I will most certainly have prepared slides and I have tonight, but I'm gonna to try to keep my energy, my flow as discussion based. I wanna to try to give you the nuance and some of the insights and more of the freestyle stream of consciousness ideas about the book rather than just reiterating everything that is in it. I think oftentimes being able to share this in this medium in a different way, inevitably I'll explain things slightly differently than I did in the book, just can help you deepen your processing. Ultimately, my goal is simple. And if you've already read chapter seven, you know what it is. That is to help you upgrade and develop a habit of effective communication that leads to effective connection with your athletes, with your clients, with your patients through the medium of cueing. Can we bridge you to the athlete and thereby help the athlete build a bridge to better movement? That's what this is about. And so we could have easily done this in one session and rushed through, but I said, no, I've written this book to fundamentally upgrade the way the world 
coaches. So it needs time. So I'm going to give it time. So again, thank you so much for taking the time to join me this evening. So am I in the right place? I think that's an important question to ask as we start to go on this journey together. And most certainly it is a journey. So the first thing I would say, well, do you consider yourself a coach? Or possibly, do you consider yourself a teacher? Now, what do we mean by the word coach or teacher? I had a nice chat with Martin Rooney on this just the other day. And so for me, I define a coach as someone that takes individuals from where they are to where they want to be. And Martin Rooney had a very similar definition, takes people from where they are to where they want to go. So if you see yourself as a servant, as a steward to help other individuals go on their journey to achieve a given outcome, then I consider you a coach. And frankly, I, I do believe that everybody in the movement profession and beyond in some form or fashion serves for another individual or others, in our case, as that coach. The second assumption that I'm going to make, and I outlined this in the book, is that you are interested in movement. And specifically, you're interested in how you can improve others' movement, right? And the mechanism or the manner that I am assuming you are interested in improving that is through your language. You are here because you want to understand how can I improve my words, my phrases, my analogies, my cues, so that I can connect better with others, so that they can connect better with their movement. And that all relies on language. And then finally, and hopefully this is why you're here, you're curious. You want to get better. You have that itch that you need to scratch. And in this case, that itch is how can I coach movement to an optimal level using my words, using my cues. So if, if you were still in the right place and you haven't checked out, the next question, how do I get the most out of these sessions? I think that's really important to ask as we go through this. And so just a couple different ideas. One, I do suggest you have read the chapters that we are going to be covering before you get on this. Obviously, I'll have no way of knowing and no worries if you don't, but use this as a source of, if you would, accountability. And I've made these sessions 90 minutes and I've spread them out so that we can answer as many questions as possible. And because it's late at night here in Ireland, I have nothing on the back of this. So I will literally do my best to answer every single question, even if it involves staying longer than 90 minutes for those that would like to hang on and hear the answers. So try to read along. Second, if you've got the book, you notice that there's quite a few activities that build from one chapter to the next. And I've put these activities in the book as a form of practice. Now, all of you work in the movement profession, so you're very switched on to the importance of practice for developing a skill. But just as that applies to developing movement in the case of our athletes, clients, and patients, it equally applies to us as coaches. Coaching, and notably coaching communication, is a skill. We have to practice it. We have to move from chance to choice. And so I outline many activities in the book to help you do just that. But it's not enough just to practice within the context of the book. As we'll talk about in our final session and looking at chapter seven in the roadmap, we must apply. Now, luckily, I know many of you are returning to work and if not, are more than likely still working remotely with your clients, your athletes, and your patients. So as best you can, use that roadmap to apply these learnings in real life. As I open in that chapter with a real story, by the way, if we do not apply this, if we do not get comfortable being slightly uncomfortable with what the book challenges us to interrogate, look at, and apply, then we're not gonna get the most out of this. You know, this is not a cookie cutter approach. You are going to have to put in the work. As I, I like to outline, this gets you on the starting line. This gives you definitions. This allows you to, let's say, have to do a little bit less searching than I did 
when I was initially curious about how to be a better coach, but still it's going to require work, but hopefully work that you get joy from. And most certainly I know your athletes will benefit from. And then finally question, you know, even today I'm reading new research on the topic of coaching, communication, and cueing. And actually over the next couple sessions, I'm going to try to introduce where it is relevant, some of the new research findings. In fact, one came out just the other day that started to look at broad internal cueing. And so for those of you that have already gotten ahead in the book to chapter four, you know I talk about the different types of cues. And I make a specific note that broad internal cues have not been well studied. So cool, some of the ideas and the questions that even I outline in the book are coming forward in the research, in the evidence. And so ask questions, ask tough questions. If you, don't dis if you disagree with something, put that question forward and let's hash it out, let's riff on it. At the end of the day, steel sharpens steel, that's how we're gonna grow. So for me, these are the four major points on how you're gonna get the most out of these sessions. So I, I was thinking of how to best phrase this. And I said, okay, our journey to a better how. For those of you that have been following me on social media, and for those of you that obviously have, have gotten through the book, you understand that a big tagline for me is elevating how we coach to the same level as what we coach. And at times, I think I can come across as being dismissive of the what. And I think tonight you'll see very clearly that that's not the case at all. It's simply that the movement profession logically has spent a lot of time cultivating our ability to know what to do through program design, reps and sets, exercises, drills, anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, right? This is the substance of what we do. But at least my experience and many individuals that I work with, their experiences, we spend very little time on how to do it. How do I get the information off the program and into the person? And notably, our communication, our language, and our cueing is central to that. So it's our journey to a better how, our journey to becoming a better coach. And so to begin with, as the first session, the reason it's only on one chapter is because I wanted to give you a little bit of background. So as you will have noticed, the book is broken into three definitive sections. And I almost think of it like an anthology, but at the same time, I wrote it to be almost like a fiction book. Now, some of you might sit back and say, hold on, but hopefully if you've read the book, you can see where I'm coming from. I actually read Stephen, uh, Stephen King's memoir on how to write and how he writes fiction before I began writing this. And funny enough, I've spoken to a number of other authors in our industry and they've read the exact same book. And so I tried to go at this from the standpoint of fiction where there's a definitive beginning, middle and end. I wanted you as the reader, as the coach, as the practitioner to go on a journey. And that journey has a number of levels, but for me, there are at least two levels. The first journey, as you will have noticed, is my journey. And that's why it was very important that I had a part one, part two, and part three intro. I wanted you to know that you are not alone. I didn't randomly have this information at birth, right? These were not logical intuitions for me when I coached. When I first started coaching, I overcoached. I gave a lot of internal cues. Socially, I'm not very good at small talk, so I couldn't always build the bridge of the relationships I wanted. So for me, this communication area was somewhere that I struggled. And it was at that time point that I realized, man, I've committed myself to the what because I can read the books, I can digest, I can espouse my theoretical knowledge. But if I don't challenge myself to work on the soft skills of coaching, which as we know are actually the hardest skills to learn, ironically, that I'm not gonna be able to take myself and my athletes to where they need to be. So I wanted you to know, and I want you to know, you're not alone wherever you are in your journey. I started at ground zero, I wanted you to have someone that you knew you were walking beside. And in now your case, I can walk beside. So even though I have written this story, I truly believe this, honestly, this is our story. I would not have written this book 
had it already existed. So I wrote this out of duty that I found this information, not mine, but I found it, I've amalgamated it, and I've tried to bring it to the surface so that everyone can benefit from it. So for me, over a decade after thinking about these concepts for the first time, it won't take you a decade. Hopefully it'll take you these four sessions reading the book, and in a year's time, you're as far as I was after 10 years. And that's why we talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. I am standing on the shoulders of many giants. And, and I do not uh, suggest for a second that I am a giant, but I'm trying to be in service of what that quote is all about. And that is to give you a foundation to grow and go farther than I did in your respective level of where you're at in your career. So that's level one, my journey. The second journey is the journey of the information. As you can see on my form, I have the word truth. And people oftentimes ask me, why did you get the word truth tattooed on your form? For me, it's my number one core value. And that I pursue objective truth where it exists. And then I pursue personal subjective truth where it does not. And so this book has both. And on the objective side, I wanted to be true to the information. And so I asked myself, what is the logical scientific story phrased in just that way, in a story that will allow you to take one piece, to build the next, to build the next, to build the next? I don't know how many of you have read the Goosebump books, but for me, reading R.L. Stein and Goosebumps was a huge joy and still is with my kids. And so with every chapter, with every paragraph, with every section, I want to leave you on that cliffhanger so that you have this information, but now I leave you wanting to know where it goes next, what it plugs into. And so I've tried to do that by design so that what normally would be a technical, possibly boring read is something that's enthralling, that brings as much fiction and popular science to what is a technical topic that for me in this form should hopefully stand the test of time. And so we do this through the learn, coach, and Q three-part approach, broken into three parts, at least in the case of one and two, and then within the physical chapters, broke into three parts as well. That was not by design, it just happened to work out that way. And so part one, learn, is this. First, we have to know what learning is and how we approach it. That's what tonight's discussion is about. Once we understand learning, we need to know what the bedrock principles that impact it look like feel like and how we make the greatest use of them. And so that's where we'll talk about attention, which is the gateway to memory and the gateway to learning. And then we'll focus on memory specifically, which is the home of learning. Because ultimately anything, whether in movement or in knowledge, that I can recall that was learned, let's say, or initially practiced at some point in my past has to be stored somewhere up in my noggin. And so memory is the home of learning. And so movement is memory. And that's how we need to think about it. So how do we improve the richness of those movement memories? But then notably, how do we coach in a way that allow those memories to be recalled in competition and practice when it counts? And in principle, if you read part one, which is the sciencey stuff, it's the most boring material in the book. I won't pretend that it's the most exciting stuff. But at the same time, I tried to bring it to life. Uh, but once you have those principles, then we get into the coach. And from a coaching perspective, we talk about three things. Finding focus. That's really the science, if you would, of cueing. The science of attentional focus that was championed by Dr. Gabrielle Wolf. And we'll talk about her a lot. I have her book with me, and I'll share this book again at the end, Attention and Motor Skill Learning. So we talk about Dr. Gabrielle Wolf, and you learn her story, right? That story of the windsurfer, if you've gotten to it, there's the book. Real story, windsurfer is on the front. And so we'll go through how focus impacts learning. But once you get through that chapter, you're like, okay, Nick, that, that's great. I understand how focus impacts learning, but how do I actually start to manipulate this? How do I change my cueing? To change focus. And that's where cue it up comes in. And we go through our 3D cueing model. And that's where we really get into the heartbeat of the book. You know, that's, the, that's the command central of the book, where the detailed information on how to get your language right 
really begins. Then we get into chapter six, going analog, right? So analogies. Chapter six, I'll just put it out there, that's my favorite chapter because I believe analogies are the superstars of cues. And to understand and really appreciate chapters eight, nine, and 10 with the examples, you gotta love and get into chapter six. And so going analog, how do we take someone's familiar to teach them something that is unfamiliar? How do we use visual language to really improve movement in the real? And so once we have part one and part two, that's the science and the application, so to speak. We've taught you how to build the fishing pole. I use that analogy later on in chapter seven. Part three then is exactly what it says, Q. How do we start to then apply this information and create better communication and connection through better cues? And we start with the roadmap. And so for me, it was really important to write chapter seven on a roadmap that fundamentally, if you haven't gotten there, it's on behavior change. It's on habit formation. So I just saw the James Clear, uh, the, the atomic habit or atomic habit, something to that effect. Uh, you, you can see my brain has been fried. So James Clear's book just sold 2 million copies on how to generate better habits. And so we know and appreciate how important this is for our athletes. But as I said earlier, coaching is a skill. Cueing is a habit. And so if we're going to change it, we have to start to look at it, unlock it, retool it, and then build it back up. And so that is my attempt to not just leave you hanging with all this information, but actually give you a flexible roadmap so that you can take this and get it off the page and bring it in to the coaching environment. And then finally, eight, nine, and 10, as I like to say, those are examples from my language locker, 27 movements. It's not exhaustive, right? But I think there's hundreds of cues in there. And what it demonstrates is how you apply the models, but how flexible our mind can be, not just to be imaginative for imaginative sake, but rather how you can use these models to truly customize language and cues to fit the group, to fit the individual that you are working with, right? So this is our journey that we will navigate. And tonight we will begin with chapter one. And so before I get into to chapter one specifically, uh, I did promise, I think it's, it's normal with these type of things to do a reading. So I wanted to, to give you just a few short passages that for me, I really enjoyed and I feel will frame up tonight or today, wherever you are time zone wise, quite well. Okay, so uh, I'm beginning toward the end of the part one opener here. I have just now taken the position at Exos and I have found out that I am now running the NFL Combine program. And the sentence starts with, it all started on a Monday. So. It all started on a Monday morning in early January. We were on the track going through a series of drills in preparation for the sprint session that followed. I recall providing detailed instructions before, during, and after each group's turn, wielding words and correcting movement with surgical precision. In my mind, everything I was saying was well articulated and correctly timed. If my words sounded good and had substance, I was happy. End of story. However, it wasn't the end of the story. In fact, it was just the beginning because I soon realized that just because my words made sense didn't mean they made a difference. And so I don't know if you've ever had that kind of an experience where you're coaching, you're on autopilot, everything to your own internal recorder sounds really good. But then you have that moment where kind of in the proverbial program that's in your mind, you look up and you see that there's not a program in front of you. There's a person in front of you. And you realize by eye contact or lack thereof, body language, positive or negative, impact of your cueing and communication, positive or negative, that things aren't getting in. They're not going the way that you thought. And so for me, this was an absolute pinnacle moment that I don't know why it stood out, but it did. And I'm like, holy smokes, I am completely focused on coaching the program. I need to start to coach the person. And in that moment, I was remarkably frustrated. I had angst because I knew something was wrong, but I wasn't quite sure of the solution. 
And inevitably, what I came to understand as being what was wrong came out in my next reading here around my time at the NFL Combine and what I observed in that year one. So one final brief reading, and then we'll kick into some substance. I'm on page five, if for whatever reason you're following along. So I'm at the NFL Combine. I'm downstairs in the Omni. Put yourself there. It's a hotel 200 meters away from Lucas Oil Stadium. I'm sitting on a couch. I'm leaning forward like this. I'm watching the big screen with all the other coaches. Our athletes are, are up and running. Heart rate is racing. Computer in front of me with the times. Computer in front of me with the videos. And I'm cross-checking everything I'm seeing to see if the work I did in Phoenix made its way to the NFL Combine. So as I watched my athletes perform that first year, I assessed their times, checking them against our pre-test scores, and I reviewed the tape, evaluating the evolution of their sprint technique from start to finish. The goal was to understand where changes, if any, had emerged. Did my athletes run faster because they had gotten stronger and could produce more force, a quality known to affect sprint speed? Or did they run faster due to changes in coordination that optimized the direction of that force, a hallmark trait of elite sprinters? In truth, any combination of these factors could improve sprint performance. But in my case, one factor seemed to stand above the rest. Although the athletes were running faster over 40 yards, my coach and I suggested that this had more to do with an upgrade to the car, i.e. strength and magnitude of force, than the skill of the driver, i.e. coordination and direction of force. In replaying each 40-yard dash, I consistently saw movement errors that I thought we changed during the preparation process. For example, athletes who were able to maintain a flat back as they came out of their stance were now hunched over, appearing to almost fall as if they took off towards the finish line. Other athletes who'd been taught the importance of a powerful forward knee drive were now reverting to the short and choppy steps one would expect to see from a two-year-old having a temper tantrum. The unavoidable truth was that something had happened between my athletes leaving our training facility in Phoenix and their running the 40-yard dash in Indianapolis. Now, as I read that story, I'm acutely aware of how many of you hopefully are nodding your head in agreement, like, holy smokes, I've dealt with that before. The person that comes in on the Monday seems to have improved coaching them up, but then comes in the following Monday and it's one step forward, one step back. The sport coach that has the player that has an amazing week of practice or even consistently practices really, really well, but can't quite cop it on the weekend. And so what we start to understand is just because the athlete improves when they're with us, does it mean that those changes are permanent and accessible when they're not? And that's where I first started to realize that there was this difference between, as we'll talk about here, the idea of performance and learning. And for me, I wanted to be a coach that focused on learning. And that gets us to the heartbeat of what tonight's talk is about. Chapter one, learn this. So we first, before we can even talk about learning, before we can talk about coaching, we have to have something to coach. We have to have something to change. And so that's why it was important for me before I could even talk about communication and cueing, we needed some hooks to hang that communication and cueing on. And so the first part of the book says, well, what before how? I need to know what to coach before I focus on how to coach it. Now this, I'll be honest, this was a challenge to write this chapter. It probably was the more difficult chapter to write because there are entire books on assessment, on program design, on biomechanical analysis. You got Gray Cook out there, Shirley Sarman, all the greats who are talking about movement. So I didn't want to do a disservice to them, but I also didn't want to do a disservice to you as the reader. I wanted to, so to speak, put my cards on the table and show you my approach that most certainly has been influenced by many on how we go about this. And so I do that through sharing this 3P model of performance or how we go about assessing the errors, whether they be technical or mechanical, 
that require changing. And the whole goal of this is to get down to a very simple fact, understanding what is coachable, understanding what is subject to change through your words, right? We know we can't fix a left hip mobility problem with some turn of phrase. We know that the best analogy in the world is not going to increase relative strength by 20% in that instant. And so we have to be able to look at what is coachable and subject to change with our words and what is trainable and subject to change with physical intervention. Again, we see the harmonizing of the what and the how. And so this is how I look at it. And I'm acutely aware that there are other models. So you don't have to use this one to get the benefit from the book. But this is simply the model that I use when I think about drilling down to that priority, or as I like to now say, the one big thing. And so the very first P within the 3P model is this idea of position. And in Altus, if you're familiar with Altus and Stu McMillan and Andreas Bem and, and those that work with that group, now Dereletto is with them, Dan Paff, they talk about this idea of shapes. So if you're familiar with the Altus model, position in my context and shapes mean the exact same thing. And so position, as we can see in the image, can they get into the requisite positions required for performing the movement? And so in the case of sprinting, do they have adequate mobility and stability to physically even get into the flexion? to get into the extension for the lower limbs and the upper limbs. And so we can assess that through the eyeball coaching eye, but let's be honest, to truly be firm and objective, get them on the table, we do a little bit of a mobility assessment, possibly a functional movement screen, or whatever flavor of, let's say, mobility and stability that you like to use, does not matter. The second piece then says, okay, they can get into those positions, theoretically, they have the range of motion and the stability, but do they actually have the strength and power to perform the movement itself, to get from position A to position B? Now, as I articulate in the book, not every single movement is limited by relative strength and power. But in the case of sport, which many of you work in and I most certainly do, relative strength is a key quality to overcome one's body weight in sprinting, in a vertical jump, in a broad jump, in change of direction, body weight matters. And so sometimes the errors that one might see, notably in the acceleration phase of sprinting, are simply a consequence of the athlete not having the requisite strength and power. And so that's the next key variable that we have to ideally assess in the weight room, in addition to what we're looking at in this case, on the field. And then finally, we have the pattern. Ah, so position, can I get into the positions? Power, do I have requisite strength and power to move from one position to the next? And then finally, patterning, do I have the coordination to move economically, to move efficiently from position A to position B, from the top of the squat to the bottom of the squat? And so if I can collect information about these three areas, I start to then understand where the priorities lie across this idea of trainable or mechanical to coachable or technical. So let's put this now through the analogy lens that I share physically in the book. And so this is the idea of car and driver, which I use throughout the book, and at least for me, is a very useful analogy to partition, so to speak, the what from the how, the mechanical from the technical. And so the car, if you would, the car represents those physical qualities of position and power. Do I have the mobility, stability, strength, and power? Do I have the hardware, the physical qualities required on which the pattern depends? Do they exist? And I refer to these qualities as trainable in that in time, I can develop better mobility. I can develop better stability. I can develop better strength and power. But do I have a magic wand or a magic cue that can develop those immediately? No, I don't. And so it's important to categorize those as such. 
The second then key variable and the final one here is the pattern. And the pattern is what I call coachable. It is an error or a movement quality that is subject to being changed by your cues, by your communication, immediately, in the moment, in the gym, on the field. And why is this distinction important? Well, there's a number of answers to that question. Firstly, it's to make sure that you're appropriately prioritizing what this athlete, client, or patient needs to get better. You know, early on in my career, I'd be coaching athletes, and two or three of them would present with the exact same error. In sprinting, in preparation for the 40 yard dash, or sprinting in general, many team sport athletes struggle to get hip flexion or get their knee forward, front side mechanics, whatever you want to call it. And I would see these three individuals that all had the same error, and I'd come up with similar cues, and everyone was nodding, everyone got the cues, but not everyone was improving. I'm like, what is going on here? And inevitably, as I started to riff on this with my colleague Dennis Logan, we realized that in certain cases, the limitation was the person didn't have a high enough relative strength. Strength to body weight ratio wasn't in favor. And so once we improved that strength to body weight ratio, guess what? Technical patterns started to unlock. So it wasn't that my coaching wasn't working. They just didn't have the physical assets to bring it to life. Equally, we had players that didn't have adequate mobility and stability. But once we got with the physical therapist, started working through some correctives and improving the real estate that they had and range of motion, again, bam, all of a sudden we'd have these light bulb sessions where technique would just come on board. And so that reassures a couple of things. One, if you're dealing with someone with physical limitations, it doesn't mean that you stop coaching them. You're still sending the right signals, the right connections, but you know you are fighting a battle you will not win until you take that parallel approach. And I think Gray Cook is one of the earliest individuals that talked about taking that parallel approach. And in my mind, this is what he was talking about. Continue to coach the patterns, but understand until those handbrakes, so to speak, on those patterns are pulled off, we're not gonna see the full change. And I think Stu McMillan summarizes this nicely when he says you can't fix a, a mechanical problem with a technical cue. Beautiful, applaud it. That's exactly what we're after here. And so I try to make this very clear in the book because I want everyone to understand that what we're chasing are these coachable features. But here's the cool thing. We're queuing, even if we're queuing a movement that has mechanical limitation. And as I said, you're still creating those intention outcome, intention outcome connections. Beautiful. But it's important for you to understand that to pace out the learning process, you need to know that the trainable features take more time at times than the coachable features. What's subject to change right now and what's going to take a bit more time? And then guess what? You set better expectations with your athletes versus coaching them with that anxiety like, why is this not changing? Well, now you know you got to get the handbrake off. You got to rid the mobility of the speed bumps. And then all that great coaching, it's a Ferrari, it's a Porsche on the Autobahn. You just simply need to get the handbrake, get the speed bumps away, right? So hopefully that gives us some indication. Now, just to put the nail in the coffin then, I try to give you an applied example for a defensive back, but frankly, there are infinite examples we could have come up with here. And so within the book, I outline the various methods or example assessments we could use. And so obviously performance is the time, in this case, to run the 40 yard dash. Pattern is the coordination. Now we could get fancy with some technology, but I'm thinking from this perspective, this is the coach's eye. This is you just having a good technical model and knowing where the athlete fits within their own individual characteristics. Power, that's your assessment of relative power, relative strength. Position, that's your assessment of mobility and stability. And so here's what's curious about this example. And if you're wondering, yes, as I say in the book, I have dealt with this person, this model of a person, so to speak, many, many times. And so the person has three people have similar times. They present with similar technical issues, right? So it could be a lack of extension for sprinting. It could be a lack of flexion. It could be a flex spine. It could be inadequate arm action, but whatever it is, let's say the three of them kind of fit into the same bucket. But then when you start to look at the car characteristics, the mechanical pieces across power and position, you start to see the differences emerge. And then, okay, this one person has a real deficit 
in their power and their strength. And all this other person has a deficit in their stability and their mobility. But then the third person doesn't seem to have any handbrakes at all. And so now I know to make the change for the person that doesn't have the handbrakes, well, they're in that sweet spot. They're coachable. I know with them, as I'm coaching and riffing and cueing, I should be able to make changes quite quickly. And my experience is that's exactly how that person develops. But for the person that has a strength and power limitation, depending on the magnitude of that limitation, it might take me an extra 10 to 14 days to start to get initial some neural adaptation and then some structural adaptation before I see a body that now has increased horsepower that my cueing and their coordination can leverage. Uh, equally, if I can't produce that range of motion in hip flexion, I can't produce that range of motion in hip flexion. And thus, I have to be able to buy or gain some of that mobility and stability before they can start to lift the hammer and use it. And so what this starts to do is it gives me a map that allows me to put the right pieces in place, but also gives me a sense of the timeline that it's going to take. And so decoding the defensive back or decoding anyone's movement for that matter. And fortunately now, this is the model used in the XPS certification for Exos and the one that Mark Verstegen talks about and many others. So it's now been road tested across a lot of different professionals. So I think as kind of a heuristic, as a model, as a shorthand, you could do worse than using this to get to the what, to get to the priority, to then start to look at how to coach it. So once we know what to coach, we can then consider how to coach it. And that's the key piece here. And I know that's why we're all here. And that's what the remainder of this talk and the remaining talks will be about. So let's start to look at the how. As we start with the how, for me, it's important to have a North Star. And if I get an opportunity to write a second edition of this book, and, and my wife is pulling her hair out as I say that comment, but if I get the chance to write a second edition, I'll put in a little section from an analogy perspective on this idea of the North Star. And so for me, learning is the North Star of effective coaching. It is the compass. It is the thing that should be guiding us always. If we are not achieving or supporting our athletes' ability to achieve learning as the outcome, we have to question what we are doing. So learning is the loudest and the most effective feedback loop for you to use as a coach. So how do we define it? There's a lot of definitions out there, but I want to give you a simple one. To learn is to own the change that is earned through practice. And so for an athlete to own the change, they shouldn't need reminders, prompts, or cues. And so as I talk about in that a and B example in the book, one was a strength coach working on an Olympic lift. Another one was a personal trainer working on a squat. We go through some different examples of where learning occurred and where learning didn't occur. But for me, learning means that the person can come back in in a future practice and demonstrate better alignment of the knees over toes, better angle and finish of the pull in the catch, in the Olympic lift, or whatever it is. Equally, in sport, what's our true litmus test? Does it transfer to the field? Let's not be happy. Burn down your happiness, whereby if they're improving, when you're coaching and reminding them, you pat yourself on the shoulder and say, happy days, it's working. No, it's an important symptom of success. I'd be worried if every time you coached, people got worse. So don't get me wrong. I want your athletes, patients, and clients to improve as you're coaching, but the story doesn't end there. It starts there. And so we've got to be able to bring them back in a future session or a future competition without reminder and see that they can actually start to own that change. And that's why in the book, I talk about the importance of the concept, the silent set. The silent set is when you've said, okay, I've coached enough, they've practiced enough, I now want to see them own it. They come in on that Tuesday morning, and you're back into that Olympic lift, and after you go through your warm-ups and give your individual or group general instructions, you bite your tongue. You don't give them that secret sauce cue that you know worked last week, and you say, off you go. Have a crack. Let's see how you do. And that's going to give you a very strong indication 
Is it on the hard drive? Have they owned the change? I cannot be strong enough on this point. That is where once I started paying attention to the echo of my impact and whether or not it was sticking day after day, week after week, month after month, once I started to do that, I was able to adapt my coaching in real time. And sometimes I didn't even know why I was adapting it, but I was adapting it against a rich information source. Simply put, can they own the change? So I'm emphatic because it's that important. And so it reinforces this idea that learning is, well, it's not guaranteed. We'd like to think that it's guaranteed, but it's not. And this brings us into this concept that I know some of you have already been asking about between performance versus learning. And so I've already now described it in a number of ways. And so for those of you that have already read chapter one, you've hopefully picked up on those. So performance, very simply put, are the acute changes that come within the context of the practice environment. And so these are the changes that come as a consequence of a constraint-based drill, a cue, or some discussion that you have. And so performance, in a shift in performance, think of it almost synonymous with practice. It's where we are in a phase where someone is intervening. Learning then has to one happen in the future. Like just let that idea marinate in your mind. You cannot assess learning in the moment that you are teaching. Does not happen. Okay, so learning has to happen in the future. It could be a day, it could be a morning to an afternoon, it could be a week, it could be a year later, but it has to be at some time point in the future. That's rule number one. Rule number two is there are no cues, reminders, or prompts that were initially used to lay down the learning in the practice stage, i.e. the silent set. So performance, that's the now, that's the acute, that's the symptom of success but it's just a symptom. Learning, it's in the future. The athlete, the client, the patient owns it. There are no reminders, prompts, and cues. If you're able to make that distinction, you have two very rich information sources to nudge. And if you're thinking, well, Nick, should I see concrete learning with every single session? And the answer is no. Sometimes you're gonna have to go through two or three sessions before you see a change. Other times, especially if it's a young individual, a novice, or a new skill, you might see a rapid change within the session and beyond. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So the timelines for learning, people always want to know. They want an equation. How long is it going to take? Even kind of your Fitz and Posner model, where you go from cognitive to associative to autonomous. Every individual, every specific skill, and where they are at from novice to expert is going to dictate how long. But that's why for me, don't worry about how long. As long as either you're seeing no change with a positive experience or change plus a positive experience, you know you're working on the right trajectory. And I think the book gives you a lot of strategies in and around how to navigate that. From performance and learning, we get to call them cousins, acquisition and retention. So within an acquisition phase, acquisition, the reason I'm using that word, it's a fancy word, because that's the word that they use in motor learning. I don't want to give you these fancy words that if you go into Google Scholar trying to learn more, you're like, what's this? I can't find anything. So I want to give you the right fishing bait for you to go deeper where you want to go deeper. So acquisition and retention are terms in motor learning that relate to practice, right? Acquiring, practice, acquisition, synonyms of each other, and then retention, learning, ownership. And so an acquisition phase is a phase of practice where you are coaching, you're doing work, you're using constraints. And retention, well, retention can be a, a moment in time. That's your silent set. Retention is the competition on the weekend to see the level of improvement that they've had, that they have retained, their ability to recall. So acquisition is practice. Retention is the application of what you've learned. So acquisition is to performance as retention is to learning, close cousins. And so in the book, I summarize kind of the three learning outcomes or lack thereof you could see with the story A was the one about Olympic lifting. Story B, as you'll recall, was the personal trainer working with the individual on the squat. And then story C was, was my story about coaching my daughter to learn to ride her bike. 
And I've had a very similar story with my son during this COVID scenario. And so in story A, we see that the improvement the coach saw during acquisition, where he was assessing motor performance was better than the retention, which means he saw an improvement and then there was a regression. Not worse than when they started, but the athlete didn't hold the change. And so if you see outcome one over and over and over again, you know, within sessions and over multiple sessions, listen, that's a feedback source that says, I got to change something up. Something about the learning environment isn't working. Possibly I have to change my coaching, refresh my cues. Maybe it's the environment and the drills, or maybe, right, punchline here, go back to my 3P model. I'm trying to fix mechanical issues with technical cues. And it's only once they upgrade their strength, power, mobility, and stability will I start to see that learning improve. Again, learning is based on the tools I have to learn with. That's the car piece to the driver. Story B is, is a very common one. And that is, I see an improvement, a desired improvement in training, and then that improvement sticks. So the fact that the motor performance and the motor learning are at the same level, some might look at that and say, well, hold on, they're not getting better. No, the reality is they got better within that training session and that changing stuck. This improvement, the improvement we're seeing in story B is the one you're going to see in more advanced individuals or individuals who you've been working with for a while. You're not going to see these rapid spikes beyond the change that you see in training, right? Sometimes you will, but usually story B is more of your experienced athlete. Now, story C, that's your novice. That's your person learning a new skill for the first time. And so they have huge upside, as I talked about kind of with that Goldilocks principle in the challenge point hypothesis. And so really story C is what we should expect with a novice or someone learning a skill for the first time. But hopefully story A, B, and C can give you a little bit of a map, a key to understand this distinction between performance and learning and the phase of acquisition and the assessment of retention. Silent set being your key tool there. Okay? So then in final, I go into a couple different research studies. And what I'd like to do is just share one. Now, I'm just reiterating what's in the book, but I recognize that some of you on the call might not have read the entire chapter one or, or book yet, or possibly are even using this to suss out if you'd like to purchase the book. So let me go through an example. And what this example illustrates is what we call in the book the performance learning distinction. And that you can have a change in performance, as we've clearly talked about, without a change in learning. And that, if you would, is the red herring of the coaching industry, in that we can become satisfied with that short-term success, that immediate gratification. And that just creates a feedback loop. Well, as long as they're improving when they're with me, I'm doing my job. Ah, but the problem is those methods don't always result in the best learning, which for me, that's your job, is to get your athlete to walk out better than when they came in, which means they own the change. And so this study, again, right here, Dr. Gabrielle Wolf, absolute pioneer of the science of cueing, but known technically as attentional focus. She had in this a study on, on volleyball and soccer. We're going to go through the soccer one. And this is the exact study that I talk about in the book. And so what she does is she takes a group of college, call them aspiring athletes, physically fit individuals with limited to no soccer kicking experience. So fundamentally, they were novices, maybe not novices in the same sense that a child would be a novice, but they definitely were not soccer players. And what she did is she broke the groups into four. This is really interesting in that there's one group that got external cues 100% of the time. And those are cues about the environment or the outcome. And we will be talking about those a lot in sessions to come. And then from there, a group got external cues 33% of the time. So one got them every single repetition of practice every single repetition of acquisition, right? And then another one got them every third rep. And then a, a third group was given internal cues. Again, we can see the example cues on the screen and they were given them 100% of the time. So every single repetition, they got a customized internal cue. And then the fourth and the final group got internal cues 33% of the time. Again, every third rep. The reason I like this is one, it's a functional task. It's kicking and kicking accuracy. So it's a complex skill. It isn't just a lab-based skill. I also like that we see both internal, external cues. 
So internal about the body and technical movements, external about environment and outcome. And we see different amounts, 100% versus 33%. And so here's what we see from a study perspective. So you have your four lines on the screen. The top line is the external group that got 100% of the time from a queuing perspective, then external 33% of the time, every third rep, then internal 33% of the time, every third rep, and then internal 100% of the time. So those are those four groups. And what we can see here is practice is synonymous with acquisition. So five block, or excuse me, six blocks of five trials. And these were the trials where they're getting the cues at the different levels. So the first thing you notice is everybody improves. So the higher the accuracy score, the more accurate they are. So we want to see those lines trending upwards. And so everybody improves. Fantastic. However, we can see that the external group improves to a greater degree than the internal group. So that might tell us something. However, we can't say that learning has taken place. We can only say that an acute improvement in performance has taken place. So then these individuals come back a day or so later, again, at some time point in the future, there's no cues, there's no reminders, there's no prompts. Off you go, they go through two more blocks of five trials, and we look at how much of their skill has remained or possibly improved as measured by accuracy. And what do you notice? Not only did the external queuing group result in better performance over the internal group, we actually saw the gap widen. And so if I go back from a slide perspective, this is what we saw. We saw story C, that they improved during practice, during acquisition, but actually when they came back, we saw a further increase in that improvement. And again, this is common in novices, which is why novices are oftentimes used in motor learning studies. We're gonna be able to see which strategies, in this case, language and cueing, have the biggest difference. Interestingly enough, what do we notice about the internal cueing group? They more or less flatline, maybe a little bit of a bump, but certainly not what we saw with the external group. And so what this starts to give us is a clear example of the performance learning distinction. And this is one of many studies that we will consider on why external cueing is likely, we will make the argument over the next three sessions, the kind of language we want to leave the athlete with. We can use internal language when we're describing and explaining. So you can lead with internal, but we want to leave them with external, the last idea that enters their mind. And without getting ahead of ourselves, we will give plenty of meat on that bone as you read and as we go through our next three sessions. So in summary then, hopefully that narrative follows the chapter, but within it, I finish the chapter with this quote. And, and this for me is just critical. And it goes back to the point I've been banging on about. And that is, you have not taught until they have learned. And if you take anything away from tonight's discussion, say what you will about the strategies and the definitions and the vocabulary for you to clearly understand the learning space, we have to have the North Star. And the North Star for us is the learning of the athlete. They own the physical change, okay? So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of this so you can see me full screen. We'll come back to that at the end. Beautiful to see that we have quite a few questions coming in. And again, most certainly as I'm asking, as I'm going through these slides, if you have further questions on what I'm saying in the now, by all means, please share those. But what I'm going to do with the time we have remaining, very happy that we are on time here, we will go through some of the questions that you have. Now, I will apologize. I'm going to read these for the first time. So if it seems that we've already answered it in the presentation, then I might just skip. One thing that you should be able to do as well is upvote some of these. I might not have that feature turned on. So if I don't, I'll put it on for the next one. So the, the first question I see here, uh, this may be covered beyond chapter one, but what are your thoughts on video analysis, similar benefits as external cues and analogies? Uh, Christopher, yeah, let's, uh, let's save that for a future topic. I will say that from a visual learning perspective and using video analysis, we're trying to achieve something very similar when we talk about analogies. So, so the fact that you've already referenced that, you probably already know the answer I'm gonna give, but I'll talk about that more 
in the future. A question, can you clarify some of the key differences in the retention phase and the performance learning distinction? Christopher, I hope that I have done that in tonight's session so far, but by all means, add your question to the queue if there's something specific that I, I missed. Uh, Sabra, good to have you on, and I will answer your email if you're still listening. So her question, how often do you do the 3P performance profile on your athletes? I work with students for years, so how often should a more formal version of this be done versus the constant analysis in the moment while we are out coaching? Well, Vern Gambetta, if not the one, was one of the ones that says, you know, I think Dan Paff said it as well, coaching is testing and testing is coaching. So insofar as the coachable features that we've been discussing, I do believe that the training environment itself provides you with the, the richest source of information from a coaching eye perspective. And back to Christopher's question, I believe the strategic use of video analysis is going to help you track the subtle nuanced differences over time. And, and now with the advent of remote biomechanical testing equipment, if you fancy that stuff, which is getting better and better in its accuracy and validity, that can be an, an augment or, or supporting your coaching eye as well. Sabre, insofar as let's say the, the first two Ps, assessing position, so mobility, stability, and assessing power, you know, for me, from a strength and conditioning perspective, we typically test in a phase-based approach, uh, which might mean every three to four weeks we transition phases. But if I'm honest, uh, training is testing and testing is training from a position and power perspective. So, so often we are going through activities that challenge mobility and stability. We are going through assessing and recording movements, lower body, upper body strength and power. You know, we use an application called push with Irish rugby where we're recording all of our lifts. So to be honest with you, we're getting a continuous stream of information around the, the 3P performance profile. Some of us call it the signature as well. So it goes by many names. So as long as you have a mechanism to update the key strength and power metrics, to update the key mobility stability metrics, and put some kind of commentary in video and in narrative on how their movement is improving, in my mind, it's not a matter of when because it's constantly going on. And for me, that seems to be the best practice for many organizations especially in strength conditioning, Sabra. So thank you, very good question. A uh, question from Ryan here. When giving a cue to an athlete, is there ever a moment when you have to stop and think about whether your cue is internal or external? Uh, if external, do you reshape your cue or are you just a pro and external cues come naturally? Ha, ha, ha. Yes, okay, so good question. We are gonna get into that in the future, but I think it's a, it's a good question. It's one that I can answer very, very quickly. When you are coaching, and I talk about this in chapter seven, when you are coaching, I do not for a moment want you to catch yourself halfway through a cue or a statement, bite your tongue, and then restart. I think that is going to psychologically erode your relationship you're trying to build with the person in front of you. So rather, instead of changing it on the fly, simply reflect. And so if you deliver an internal cue, one that maybe you're not happy with, or you're just trying to convert your cues to external. And let's say you do it on the first set of a lunging pattern. You catch yourself, no problem. So maybe that internal cue was keep your knees straight ahead. So on the next set, all you're gonna do is you're gonna refresh that cue. Okay, so we still want you to keep that knee straight ahead. But to do that, I want you to imagine you have a headlight on your kneecap, keep that headlight forward. And you'd learn about how to do that in chapter six from an analogy perspective. And so I use the term of converting cues. And so just do that at a normal, natural pace. And all of that is laid out throughout chapters four, five, and six, five and six in particular, but certainly chapter seven in the roadmap, Ryan, deals with all of those strategies, the if-thens of when you get stuck and how do you improve. Okay, so thank you for your question. Uh, Raf, some of your favorite cues you notice you use all the time. Raf, I'm going to get into that in future sessions. That one is a, a long one. I have a lot of favorite cues, and I'll demonstrate those notably in session four. Okay. Sue, uh, will this recording be available? Yes. If you're wondering the same thing, all of these recordings are going to go up on YouTube after this. So after each session, I'll put these up. Uh, Ramez or Ramey, I apologize if I pronounce any of these names inappropriately. Uh, do you believe that there is ever a time to place 
uh, in place for internal cues if the goal is to improve body awareness versus a specific physical outcome, lift, punch, and kick. So the, the answer to this question, if you want to bounce ahead, now I should know this offhand, but I believe it is in chapter four, if not in chapter four, five. So in four and five, I talk about where internal cues should live in the coaching communication loop. And it's interesting, Ramez, that you ask about body awareness. I work very hard in the book to clearly delineate the difference between giving an internal cue and promoting improved body awareness. So there's actually an entire section just on that. And I will bring that point up again when we get to that. It'll more than likely be session three. So thank you for your question. And again, I do apologize if I'm pushing some of these down the road but I want to try to make sure we get to all the ones that are relevant for chapter one. Uh, yeah, great question here. My question is from page 15, thank you, and the Goldilocks principle. How do you assess skill level out of an individual relative to their stage of mastery? It, it, this is such a good question. I'll be honest, when I was doing my research for my own dissertation, we were trying to classify whether our soccer players and our sprinters in my study, and it was a 10 meter sprint study, were novice, let's say intermediate or advanced or novice to expert. And the literature on this from a definition perspective is, is quite poor. So for me, I will make a general intuitive assumption based on quite literally how much experience they have. If they have no experience with the, the drill, the activity or the sport, we'll call them a, a pure novice. If they're familiar with the sport, let's say they're, they're a sprinter, but they've never done this specific drill where they might be an intermediate to advanced sprinter, but they might be more novice to intermediate with this drill itself. And so I try to look at both their experience with the overall sport, but then their specific experience with the drill or the skill within the sport that I'm teaching. So almost there's, there's two levels to that. And, and I'll be honest, y'all, for me, that's just based on experience and logic. Ultimately, though, when it comes to looking at their trajectory, we just want to see that there is an improvement in trajectory. So as long as I'm using learning as the outcome, and I'm seeing at the very least the change in practice is the change that is maintaining, or the change in practice is getting a bump and there's further improvement session after session, as long as I'm keyed in on that as a feedback loop, I'm going to be able to move them across those natural phases of cognitive, associative, and autonomous. And even, and we'll talk about it, those three stages, it suggests that learning is something linear and, and, and learning isn't always linear. And so for me, because it's complex, trying to say this, then this, then this is a fool's agenda. But if I know the key outcome of what learning looks like and its richness, as we've discussed, and I constantly key in on that North Star, even though my, my path is going to be winding, inevitably the trajectory will be positive and I'll get them where I want. So I guess long story short, I'm not fussed on the labels of where they're at. I simply describe literally where they're at, and my question is the next time I look at them, is that description, so to speak, improved? Mechanically, as well as technically, right? Trainable versus coachable. So y'all, thank you for the question, and yes, it'll be on the YouTube. Uh, Sabre again, I work with many coaches in training that come in with very different levels of knowledge of the skills they're teaching. How do you encourage, recommend introducing the principles in the book for those that are wanting to coach but are still learning some of the skills themselves? Wow. Sabra, I, I struggle with this question, not because it's a difficult question, but because it is a critical one. And really what you're asking is how do I get the balance of the what and the how correct? And so here's what I will tell you. Even if this person is developing their knowledge of technique and skill, for me, if they're out coaching, they're out communicating. And thus, there's two sides to making that communication effective. One, the communication needs to accurately represent what they're looking to change, which means they need to understand what they're looking to change. And that's the technical stuff that you mentioned in the question. But at the same time, as that's emerging, if we're not giving them the skills to simplify and to communicate effectively, then we're missing a key opportunity in their development. And so in the same way that you slowly progress their knowledge of what they're coaching, 
I would slowly introduce the principles of how to coach it in parallel. In the same way we develop physical qualities and coordinative qualities in parallel. So how might we do that? Let me just give an example. Is it burdensome to teach a newbie coach that they should only give one cue at a time when teaching a skill? Is that a burdensome piece of knowledge? My argument would be no. And in fact, we're gonna save that coach and the people they're coaching a lot of trouble by explaining that early on because as we all know, especially if you've read chapter two, pay attention, attention's a limited capacity resource. And so even if I'm getting the technical error correct, if I'm not communicating it correctly, I'm still achieving a, a net zero, possibly a negative outcome. And so Sabra, it would really be up to you to pick the core principles, which are one cue at a time, teach them the coach communication loop, and teach them some of the basic principles around external cueing. Here's the cool part. External cues and analogies are lay language. Push the ground away. Explode off the line like a jet taking off. We actually have to learn internal cues, if you think about it, through all of our biomechanical textbooks, through our anatomy, through our physiology. So I'm not saying that we don't learn that, but what you have an opportunity is to show them where that language goes. That language goes as a description to describe what your athlete, what your patient is doing. But when you're actually coaching it, we get to use simple, rich language that you and I can all relate to. And so as I'm going through this organic stream of consciousness to get to the end of, of this very long-winded answer, I think to realize it has to be parallel. Start with the shallow, superficial principles that you know, even if they don't understand them, will get a positive outcome. And then you deepen the trenches on their understanding of what sits behind it once they have the what, the technical piece is down. But um, really good question, Sabra. Raf says, ways you phrase and or questions you ask and how you expand them during initial interview, during the initial sessions with a client. And so, okay, this is an interesting question. And I, I do want to answer this one now because I don't know if I get to it directly in the book, but I think there'll be plenty of sections that get us to, to similar type questions. And so for me, Raf, I'm going to take this from the standpoint of how do I assess early on the way my athlete learns. And so many of us are familiar with this idea of learning styles. Technically, learning styles are not a thing because that would suggest my style of learning is the only way I can learn. So technically, if you want to talk about learning, you want to talk about learning preferences. How do I prefer to learn? And so I want to give you one powerful question to ask anybody. And that is, you're talking to the, the client, the athlete, or uh, the patient. And you say this, Describe your favorite teacher to me. Describe your favorite coach to me. And I love that question as an early way to build a bridge and for me to start to understand them because guess what? In that answer, they're going to tell you how they prefer to learn. You know, did they have someone that was hard on them? Did they have someone that used a lot of visuals? Did they have someone that was really empathetic or some combination thereof? And you can start to ask different questions. Well, how did they communicate with you? Or how do you like to be communicated with? And already what we're starting to do is establish a relationship where we're, if you've read farther in the book, we're starting to understand their language locker. We're starting to understand their preferences. But at the same time, that gives us insights on how we can become a chameleon to bring our tone up, to bring our tone down, to communicate directly, communicate a bit more passively, to start to fit their needs. And then over time, get to know them ourselves. So Raph, really good question. Uh, Ramez, do I, do I do my own graphic design? So I uh, might be asking around the book itself. So I designed all the graphics in the book. And so many people have been asking me this. So yes, I've designed every single graphic in the book conceptually. So I've mocked them all up, hand-drawn. If you know me, most of them are in PowerPoint. And then Sean Roosevelt and his team at Human Kinetics actually brought them to life artistically and put them into the book. But for me, conceptually, yeah, the, the art of the entire book, every single analogy, I designed because for me it was important that the book looked visually and represented visually as much as it did in written word. And if you get to the end of the book, you realize, wow, the best coaches use short phrases that are visual to capture the outcome the athlete, client, or patient is trying to achieve. And so I wanted to, to literally bring that to life. And just small, fun little footnote, if you're interested, the inspiration for the analogy section came out of 
the very first Mary Poppins, not the newer one that emulated it, but the very first one. And the very first Mary Poppins is where uh, Walt Disney and his team learned how to start to bring, if you would, a, a human character. There might've been a movie or two before that where they applied this, but bring a human character into a cartoon world that was meant to look like a chalk drawing. And so for me with analogies, we're trying to pique the curiosity and the visual system of the athlete. And so it's like, oh, how do we capture this? So we took live action photos. So the, the athletes, the models in there are, are live action shots. We were out on a track doing all those movements. And then we dropped them in to this whimsical world that kind of for us had a graphic feel. And so Mary Poppins was the inspiration behind the concept of the design. And then obviously the analogies are based on the models in, in, chapter, in chapter six. So great question. And thank you. Uh, Raf, which place has the fastest shipping on your book? Ha! So uh, in the States, it's still Amazon as well as Human Kinetics. Because of the COVID scenario, the international Amazons, and I do apologize, have been slow to get the book, but uh, humankinetics.co.uk is shipping it as well if you're, if you're in Europe or around. Okay, but Amazon should be fully updated here within the week. And I feel like I keep saying that, but hopefully I'm true or, or honest or right one of these days. Uh, ben Buck, is there a way we can get the link to the YouTube page? Yes, it's, it's the language of coaching is the handle on YouTube. And again, this will be up there. Uh, Sue, is a pattern the same as ability at doing a task? Okay, Sue, really good question. Well, for me, when I look at, at ability, it's all encompassing. You know, can I do the task? Can I achieve the outcome or not? So for me, ability is the, is the comb composite or the combination. Do I have the, the position and the power? Do I have mobility, stability, strength, and power? And then do I have the coordination to bring it all together? I think conventionally, when we talk about ability or skill, most people are referring to coordination or patterning, as I articulated in the book. But really, the net ability of someone is the composite of position, power, and pattern, which gives rise to our central and fourth and final P, and that's performance. So thank you, Sue. Uh, Sasha, do you know roughly how many participants were involved in the internal external queuing study? Uh, very good question. Sasha, I will seek to answer that in the next session. Equally, if you email me directly at info at the language of I can not only tell you the amount of participants, but I can point you to the study itself. So thank you, Sasha. Uh, Raymond, would it be a good idea to have a list of cues handy when teaching and coaching movement? Again, Raymond, this is a great question and one that I'll get to in more detail in session four, but in short, the answer is yes. What I have found for many coaches is when they're initially trying to apply these principles, if they've never done it before, they're not necessarily comfortable coming up with external cues on the fly. So as I like to say, you need to practice this skill when you have the time so you can deploy this skill when you don't, when you don't, i.e. there's an athlete, a patient or a client look at you, eyes open, like, okay, so what do you want me to do next? And when we're under that pressured scenario, we have paralysis by analysis as well. You don't want to be suddenly trying to say three Ds, distance, direction, description. How do I come up with it? So long story short, yes. If you can start to build your language locker, outline ahead of time, your two to three major cues that seem to be working. And if you do riff, you do freestyle and come up with new cues that seem to be working, take five seconds, write them down after the set, or at the very least have a notebook and write them down after a training session. I cannot tell you how many sessions I've left where I was just on fire, I was in flow, but following flow, I forgot everything that I'd said. So I think it's very good to, to get them down as they come to you organically, but prepare, right? You, you'll fall to your level of preparation. So prepare for sure, Raymond. Okay, Jim, uh, book recommendation question here. I love the Gabrielle Wolf a book plug as this provides some further reading should we want to dig deeper. Do you have any other book recommendations? Well, I, I am gonna go over different books on every session. Uh, again, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, Attention and Motor Skill Learning is what Jim is referring to, again, by Dr. Gabrielle Wolf. This is the, the original text, the only text. It was done back in 2006, 2007. It talks about the core science that I highlight in, in chapter four, finding focus. It's the core science behind attentional focus and cueing. I would say the, the next book recommendation that I'm gonna talk about 
not next time, but the following is the inner game of tennis by Timothy Galway. I mean, still, if you go on the Am on Amazon's channels and look at sports psychology, sports training and tennis, the inner game of tennis, even though it sounds like it's just a tennis book, which on the surface it is, is one of, if not the best coaching books ever written. For me, I profile Timothy Galway to the same extent in the inner game of tennis as I do Gabrielle Wolf, because these are pioneers. These are the giants whose shoulders I'm attempting to stand on. So I cannot recommend the inner game of tennis enough. Even though the context is tennis, the principles from coaching are universal. So Stuart Bourne, in your Altus presentation, Coach Like a Caveman, you had included psychology as a fourth P. Any reason to take it out? Was it too vague to assess like the other three Ps? Stuart, that is a great question. So Stuart is correct in saying that I used to say position, power, pattern, and psychology. And I think you nailed it on the head, Stuart. Talking about psychology, it is such a rich and complex domain. I didn't feel that I could do it service. But ultimately, when I look at psychology, the, the way we interact with psychology, at least in part, is so heavily embedded in how we coach the pattern. I didn't feel that I was necessarily leaving any of my ideas off the table because all of my ideas on how to interact and drive positive psychology, build rapport, so much of that is embedded in how we use language through the coaching communication loop. But most certainly, even though I won't add that fourth P, at least not as of today, to a second edition, I will talk about other features of psych psychology insofar as our communication impacts it with athletes in future books and future editions of this book. So Stuart, very, very good question. Uh, Jim came in with a, a follow-up from a coaching perspective. Yeah, uh, there's other books, Wooden and, and Belichick here. So Jim, now that I know there's great interest, I will add, let's say, at least two to three books per, per session. So that means nine more book recommendations will come over the course of the next three. Uh, Mike McDonald, your slides are superb. Thank you, Mike. Uh, did, you, did your publisher designer give you the graphics and font for the slide deck as part of your agreement with them? Yeah, so when, when, you create, when you create a book, you have a certain agreement. And so for me, I continue to use the assets, most certainly because conceptually I designed them all, but you have an agreement on how they're used. And, and this most certainly is one of the environments I can use them in. Uh, Jamie, would you consider grouping your athletes after a few practices in a way to meet each athlete's needs, i.e. position, power, and pattern? Beautiful question. And so when I used to do a lot of work with the functional movement screen and Greg Cook, we would talk about this all the time on, on how do we categorize our athletes, so to speak, by their common errors. And this was important when we were doing pillar prep or what we call it movement health with Irish rugby, we'd kind of say this is the hip group. This is the shoulder group. This is the trunk group. You know, insofar as position, power, and pattern is concerned, those qualities sit across the athlete and sit across the entire training program. And so for me, Jamie, it's less about, let's say, bucketing them into different programs, albeit someone might get a bit of extra mobility work. Someone might get a bit more of a power versus hypertrophy program, most certainly. I think the most important thing in the context of the book is to understand that they exist and actually be able to tell that story to the athlete. Because what I found in many times, I'd be coaching athletes as if they should be able to make the change right now, but come to find out they have a physical limitation, which was slowing the whole process down. So I'm anxious and frustrated, they're anxious and frustrated. So while the training needs to fit position, power, and pattern, going back to the fourth piece psychologically, I need to be able to articulate their journey and how much of it falls into that trainable long game and more of that coachable short game that we know we can improve on the fly. So Jamie, really good question. Uh, Jenna has a question on silent sets. Very good. So when using silent sets, do you include them in your program at pre-planned times? How much information do you tell your athlete about its purpose and expectation? Could it be used as a source of motivation and excitement about learning when your athlete coach has more glamorous ideas about what training is? That is a fantastic, rich question, which has some of the answers implied within it. And so I use silent sets impromptu. So within a given coaching session, let's say I have five sets of activity, coach, 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 silent, silent. So absolutely. 
you can use silent sets within. Most certainly, I will program them in. You may even write it physically on the program where when I come in, it might be silent, 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 coach, coach. And so there's really no right or wrong way to use them. The key is to use them. And Jenna, you absolutely nailed it. I explain to my athletes what the silent set is. And I say, when I stop talking, it is your time to start performing, to own the change. You know, in the context of when I worked at the NFL Combine, I'm telling them, listen, I'm not the one running the 40. I'm not the one who's going for the biggest contract, the biggest interview of my life. You are. So you have to learn to own the moment, to own the silence. And so inevitably, Jenna, you nailed it in your question. We get them excited about the silence set, excited about owning it. And so for me, if they're, if they're riffing, if they're doing well, set one, set two, set three, we might go all five sets. And I always finish with a debrief though. So we got to close the loop for them. If we say nothing, then we're just being negligent. So the debrief inevitably will happen. But for me, I would even have silent set days. And we can talk about this research study in the future, but there's this whole idea of athlete-led feedback or athlete controlled feedback, where the athlete decides when they get the feedback by saying, hey coach, can you give me some feedback? So I would have days that in principle, what is that? That's a silent set day where I say, you let me know if you need feedback. You let me know if you wanna bounce an idea off me. And this is all in the spirit of autonomy supportive coaching, which is central to nurturing the motivation that powers the attention, that powers learning. So Jenna, Beautiful question. Have fun with the silent sets. Use them for what they're good for, which is assessing learning. Riff freestyle with them, plan them, but definitely explain their value and their purpose to supporting the athlete's journey. Scott Livingston, my good friend with his wonderful podcast. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Nick, Scott Livingston here. How have you negotiated the process of unlearning language? Beautiful. Okay i.e. someone comes in having been trained by professional A. They use particular language to teach movement. And your language is perhaps foreign. In my case, working in Ireland, at times quite literally, or to take it to another level, an athlete from another culture where the nuance of language is different. Do you try to understand their jargon or language or do you try to teach them your language? Wow, such a beautiful question. One that we could probably spend an entire 90 minute session on. Now. Before I answer that question, we are at our 90 minute window. I'm gonna stay on and continue to answer these questions. This is gonna be recorded. I will share it on YouTube again. So if you have to jump off, please by all means, but I wanna make sure we get all these answers out to those that want them. So if you are jumping off, thank you so much. I do hope you can join us again in two weeks time, okay? But for now, back to Scott's question. Scott, I have dealt with this uh, many, many times, and I think there's a couple different layers to, to answering it. So the first thing is, if the language that they are attuned to is very internal, very technical, right? They do a lot of analysis. And let's say this is someone who classically has struggled from overthinking, paralysis by analysis. So already in your own mind, you see two things. One, they use a lot of internal language. Two, very technical. They tend to overthink. So we know, just like sometimes they have to unlearn technique, to use your phrase, which I love, they have to unlearn this language. And so what I try to do with those athletes is first lead with empathy. And I listen. So I say, well, how would you normally have thought about performing, let's say, this clean or this snatch or in baseball, this swing? And they start to explain. And let's say they're just spewing out internal cues and technical language. Well, then the next question I would say is, okay, what do you actually think about then while you swing or while you perform this Olympic lift? And maybe again, they start to spew, say, okay, well, do you think that we could get all of those ideas down to, to one core idea for this next repetition? And so I'm just using a little bit of motivational interviewing, using questions to see if we can guide them down to come to their own conclusion that, wow, one, that's too much information to think about, and even then, the type of information that they're spewing might not be productive. And so I had an athlete, a triathlete, who would always talk about knee position. And I said, well, when you're running, 
Do you think it's really possible for you to focus on your knee position and your overall technique at the same time? Do you think that's the most efficient way to move? And they kind of would sit back and they're like, well, I've never thought of that before. Like, well, to get your, to get your knee straight ahead, really what we've identified is we need a little bit more force off the ground. So as you're running on this next repetition, I just want you to imagine, and we were in Phoenix at the time, so this wasn't too difficult. I just want you to imagine the ground is hot and you're just trying to get off the ground as quickly as possible. And that was meant to help their, their push and their force and then the alignment of their contact. And so I use a lot, I talk about this in the book, this idea of cue conversion. So I lead with empathy, I mirror and echo their language, I respect their language, and then I simply try to give it a new coat of paint. But I try to bring them on that journey with that new coat of paint. Now, that's a very specific scenario where I feel the language they're using and the way it's promoting certain thoughts is unproductive. We then have another scenario where you're working in a different culture, possibly a different language. Well, let's say they're still speaking your language, but culturally their jargon, their phrases, their slang different than yours. And that most certainly is my experience coming from the US to Ireland and going from American football to rugby. So in that case, it wasn't so much that they had to unlearn internal cues as much as I had to learn the colloquial normative phrases and start to make sure I was using language that jived with them. So ultimately, you have to be able to adapt and pivot on both. I would say the second one's far easier because that requires me asking questions, seeking to understand, getting to know the culture, the sport, and the people I'm working with. The, the whole converting or helping them unlearn language, far more difficult. Take it slow, lead with empathy, get them to talk, mirror their language, still include and use their language, but think about converting it, giving it a, a new coat of paint. So Scott, as always, thank you for an eloquent and very intriguing question. Uh, another Scott, Scott Lang, has your experience with cueing and research into ideas like practice variability significantly changed how you structure or template practices? Yeah, you know, I'd say the biggest thing for me is I look at this idea and, and we can talk about this in future sessions. And so obviously you can hear my English bulldog barking in the background. So I apologize. She's excited. She's heard the ice cream man. And so when we look at this idea of cues and constraints, environment, constraints and drills, cues, language, but the reality is cues and constraints for me work together. When I come up with a drill, it's to draw attention to a certain feature of the drill, a certain feature of the environment to make a change. When I give an external cue, I'm drawing attention to that same environment. And so for me, it's, it's been a matter of oftentimes, Scott, uh, doing less. I find now I use a lot less drills from a movement skill development and a speed development perspective. And I try to be much more precise with the quality of my drills, much more precise with the quality of my communication so that we can get more out of them. Because every time I introduce a new drill, that requires more explanation, and possibly I remove another degree of freedom away from the outcome skill I'm working on, which might be jumping, sprinting, or agility. So cognizant, not a great answer to the question, but most certainly the biggest thing for me is how language and the environment work together. Language that draws attention into the environment and environment that draw in attention to the right areas. Uh, Chris Allen. Generally, how do you know when to change cues? In other words, how long do you continue to use a cue if only gaining acute performance but not yet learning? Chris, really, really good question. We will talk about how long to use cues and when to refresh cues in future sessions. Hopefully, you'll join us for those. Uh, Raymond, what type of internal or external cues would you use with an athlete that is having a learning disability? Is there a difference? So beautiful question. My wife has worked as a therapeutic horse riding instructor, and we actually have a few other uh, therapeutic horse riding instructors on this call. Now, most certainly therapeutic horse riding is not just for those with disabilities, but certainly many individuals with physical or cognitive disabilities utilize therapeutic horse riding as a way to emotionally connect with the horse, but also to physically develop their body. And so what's really interesting about that is I've given presentations on cueing and what we say matters to therapeutic horse riding organizations, notably PATH, and the feedback from those instructors has been phenomenal. That by turning technical language into lay visual language through external cues and analogies, using the horse as a reference point instead of the body, especially if spatial awareness and language might be limited for those individuals, 
it's absolutely opened things up. And there's plenty of research on physical disabilities. So Parkinson's notably, as well as stroke, as well as individuals with various cognitive disabilities in the attentional focus literature. So again, if there's specific areas you wanna grow your knowledge in, I believe again, Raymond here, please go ahead and shoot me an email at info at the language of coaching.com and I will be happy to share that research. Okay, so we're coming to the end. Uh, we have probably time for a few more questions here. It popped up to 37 by the end, so I think I'd be going till midnight to get them all. So to be respectful of people's time, I'll do a few more here. Uh, Nathan, how do you queue across languages? Uh, image a scenario where you have a few English speakers in multiple other languages. The group is also poor movers. So I think we're gonna get at this in future sessions, but you have to use the power of visuals. You know, one of the reasons that we wrote the book the way that we did and we designed it the way that we did, you know, if you go to the final chapters, I wanted this to be, you know, a physical resource that people could actually start to show their athletes, notably if English and language is a key barrier. So whether you use my book or you create your own, just in PowerPoint, little analogies, or you use video and demonstration, but I think you need to utilize the visual system as the universal language, Nathan, to go about this. Hopefully my book can give you a bit of inspiration on how you can get creative beyond just using the, the video analysis. So I, I, I know that's short, but we will talk about that again in the future. Uh, AJ, for coaches of youth, youth athletes, uh, would you recommend any monitoring tools other than athletes' feedback to focus on measuring the effectiveness of coaches' instruction, language in order to increase athletes' motivation? So basically, is there an assessment to understand better how the athlete wants to be communicated with? Most certainly, there are various inventories and questionnaires. It's actually, AJ, to be honest with you, a question that I have myself. So if anyone listening knows of any, send them through. But many of them are not, let's say, getting at the heart or the substance of what I'm looking for, which is the nuance around the physical cueing itself. You know, so for me, the way I've approached it, and, and I actually would like to create an inventory and have a research group assess it, is simply provide a few different images of different movements that you coach, okay? And then next to those images, provide, let's say, two internal cues, maybe one or two external cues, and maybe one or two analogies. You know, I just think give a couple different options. So maybe four to six options. And then what you can have them do, you just, you know, draw that up in PowerPoint or a Word document, PDF it and hand it out and have them circle the cues that make the most sense to them. So steal that idea. I think it's a very simple way to get an insight of the way they're gonna like language. For me, if they like internal language, going back to Scott's question, maybe they're a bit more technically minded and I'd, I'd, I'd bet a fair sum of money, that's how they've been coached. If they like the external cues, they probably like things that are a bit more literal, straight to the point. If they like analogies, they're probably more visual, possibly kinesthetic. And you even might use some of the learning styles inventories, knowing though this learning preferences, not only the way that they can learn, but simply the way they prefer to learn. And you leverage those two pieces of information. And I think that plus your organic conversations, you're pretty far down the way of knowing how best to communicate with them and accelerating your relationship building. Okay, uh, we're here to the bottom now. Rob, hi Nick. Once the pattern is learned, would you consider reverting using the technical language if the athlete shows an interest in the biomechanics? Rob, we're definitely gonna get to this again when I, when I talk about the coaching communication loop. But for me, I'll give you a simple answer, and that's yes. If we have someone that's a student of the movement, a student of the sport, Dan Paff, amazing track coach and mentor of mine, works for Altus, says he wants his athletes to become PhDs in their sport. For me, the key thing is let's separate knowledge of doing and doing. So knowledge of what to do and knowing how to do it. They're not the same thing. And so for me, don't use the knowledge of what to do as a surrogate for your cues. And so when we look at the coaching communication loop, you can use the debrief to do the video analysis, to go through the details, but still out of that, we have to synthesize out the one big thing, the external cue or the analogy that can be the guiding light to focus and drive their attention to summarize and achieve that global movement outcome. If the summary there is three technical cues, 
we're cutting our nose off to spite our face. And so let's nurture, let's empathize, let's support the increase of knowledge of what, but also giving them cues so they know how. And that's where the coaching communication loop, I believe therein lies the answer and the system to that specific question. You can have your cake and eat it too. Internal, external, and analogy, they live on the same neighborhood, but just in slightly different houses. Okay. Thank you for your comment there, Raf. Very nice. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And then finally, Andrew, last but not least, what would what cues would you use for athletes with physical impairments, loss of legs, arms, beautiful? Again, I think that's similar to the question I answered earlier on physical and mental disabilities. I think we can get into that more from an analogy perspective, but primarily individuals that have limitations with their body, I believe analogy is going to be the best way to go because we can use the, the virtual environment, the matrix of the mind to take the virtual and bring it into to the real. And so what I would encourage you, Andrew, because I want to respect your question, as well as the one that came up earlier, uh, if you have specific individuals with specific disabilities or impairments that you want to share with me, again, info at thelanguageofcoaching.com, I can then speak to those directly in future sessions. So, Andrew, I do believe that that is our last question. So if you can entertain me for just, or if I can entertain you just for a few more minutes, we will, uh, we will finish off here. So that wraps us up for this evening. That's Global Book Club, session one, June 3rd, right? Chapter one in the books. Our next session, which if you've registered, is already going to be in your inbox from Zoom, is going to be two weeks from now, June 17th. Again, 2 p.m. Eastern, that's 7 p.m. Irish time. We are going to be going through chapters two and chapter three. So we're talking about paying attention or pay attention and remember when. These are your two meaty chapters. There's a lot in there. So I'm not going to be able to cover it all, but I'm going to grab the cliff notes of the key areas, again, leaving the last 30 minutes. I thought the last 30 minutes of questions seemed to work really well tonight. So if you join us again, you can get your questions in early in the evening, and then I'll be able to answer them over the last 30 minutes. Uh, one final, let's say, comment or reach out to you. One Thank you again so much for your time this evening. It's been fantastic. For me, if you are enjoying the book, if you believe in the message, if you believe that we need to continue to share this, one of the best ways from a grassroots perspective to support this initiative is obviously sharing that the book is, is effective, that you're enjoying it, what you're learning socially, possibly getting copies for other individuals, but notably, and again, this is one of those things that as an author I hate to do, but if you believe in it, or if you're passionate about what we're going on, if you can go on Amazon and leave a review, that would be greatly appreciated. It is so important for the grassroots effort. My goal is to put this book in every single person's hands to teach movement so that we can affect the millions and the multiples of individuals that are impacted now, hopefully positively, by those individuals. And I know all of you are within that group. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to join me tonight, especially you who are still here at the very end. You're absolutely legendary. Uh, enjoy the book, apply, get into it, and I'll see you now in two weeks time, June 17th. Again, thank you so much. Have a great evening and we'll be back soon. Be safe in the meantime. Cheers.